Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Criminal Justice Reform in America, Policing and Pretrial Detention. I'm Dr. Rayshawn Ray. I'm a David Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'm joined today by a series of experts focused on police reform and pretrial detention. What you'll hear are um, outcomes from two chapters of our joint report with the American Enterprise Institute. This is a bipartisan report that assembled a team of scholars, practitioners, policy experts to come together to talk about ways to reform our criminal justice system. I'm delighted to be joined today by Brent Oral, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, who also is uh, the co-editor along with me of this very, very important project. I just wanna say that it's been a, a pleasure to work with Brent up to this point, And we hope that the sort of things that we are able to share today will be quite useful for people. As I bring on Brent to do the introduction, I wanna say that all the viewers who are joining us can submit questions for the speakers by emailing events at brookings.edu. That's events at brookings.edu or via Twitter using the hashtag CJ reform. Again, that's CJ reform. We hope that you'll engage with us in addition to uh, the very thoughtful questions that we've already received. So Brent, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Rashawn. Um, and I wanna thank you as well for your um, thoughtfulness and your engagement with me on this project. Um, it's been a real pleasure to get to know you and to get to know the, some of the scholars that are affiliated with Brookings who made contributions to this, um, to this uh, volume. Um, and I also wanna thank, uh, big thanks to the uh, Brookings communication staff um, for their work in, not just in organizing and executing today's event, but the communication staff that worked in putting the volume together on what was a very compressed timeline. Uh, and we're very grateful to have had their assistance. Um, so, uh, Rishan uh, asked me to do a little bit of an introduction to this um, volume. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail into the recommendations and conclusions because that's what the conversation is supposed to be about today. Um, I just wanted to set some context around uh, why this volume and why are we doing it now. Criminal justice reform uh, is one of the unicorns, I think, of the current federal policy landscape. For the past nearly 20 years, presidents and congresses of both parties have worked together to build and maintain a bipartisan coalition to pursue the long-term goal of reducing incarceration and improving the life outcomes um, and prospects for those who have been involved in it. In 2004, President George W. Bush sought and received appropriations from Congress to create new federal programs targeted at assisting men and women returning from prison in finding job training, supportive services, and employment. His prisoner reentry initiative helped open the way for the 2008 Second Chance Act that has invested hundreds of millions across multiple federal agencies in a wide range of reentry and other criminal justice reform efforts. President Obama continued and expanded on these efforts to improve employment and educational opportunities with initiatives like Ban the Box, uh, the Presidential Commission on 21st Century Policing and Incarceration, and a pilot program to restore Pell Grants for prisoner education. President Trump signed into law the First Step Act, uh, focusing on sentencing reform and full reinstatement of Pell Grants for prisoners. And now President Biden, one of the key authors of the 1994 crime bill has announced his support for reforms that would seek to address over-policing and over-incarceration without leaving communities uh, with inadequate law enforcement protection and service, which they need and deserve. Despite this record of bipartisanship, we today are at risk of falling into an unhelpful binary, particularly with regard to policing. Support the blue or defund the police. Adoption of either of these polls would be a mistake, particularly for communities that are already disproportionately affected by over-policing, bad policing, and crime of all types. 
This report is a first effort at creating a policy forum that actively supports continued bipartisan dialogue around criminal justice reform. The report is organized into seven chapters that roughly follow the sequence of an individual's journey through the criminal justice system, policing, pretrial and sentencing, prison reform, considerations for juvenile justice, promoting desistance from criminal behavior, education and training, and reentry. Each chapter begins with a level setting review of what the existing evidence base tells us on the topic. And this is followed by recommendations for short, medium and long-term reforms. Beyond that, there, is, uh, there are also recommendations for additional research topics and author suggestions for additional reading for uh, interested um, per, uh, users of the volume. Today, we're focusing on policing and pretrial uh, and sentencing policy, but I hasten to add that the bulk of the report is devoted to strategies for assisting those already involved in the criminal justice system to chart a different and better course for their lives. Indeed, if we focus only on the front end of the system without paying attention to issues of rehabilitation and restoration, we may inadvertently reinforce the idea that policing, prosecution, and incarceration are the only tools available to us for creating more just, a more just and more humane criminal justice policy and risk by neglect or by policy errors, continuing social and political division. This is a council of despair that we can't afford to follow. Brookings and AEI will be scheduling follow-on events for the rest of the chapters to broaden the conversation about what true criminal justice, justice reform might look like. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not say that participation in this project by an author on one topic should not be misconstrued as an endorsement by that author of other chapters or recommendations. These are complex matters that require nuanced responses. Our intention is to continue to press into these topics in the hope of developing a broader consensus on each. And with that, I'll turn the conversation over to Dr. Bell for an exploration of chapter one on policing reform. Brent, thank you so much for that great introduction. And, and as you know, we really aim to align with the first 100 days of the Biden administration. And as you said, with that speedy timeline, we were able to do that. So I wanna bring on uh, Dr. Monica Bell, who has graciously agreed to be our moderator for the police reform uh, panel. Uh, Monica Bell is an associate professor of law at Yale Law School and associate professor of sociology. Before that, uh, she was a fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School. And there's so much that I could say about uh, Dr. Bell, but as we talked before, she definitely wants to get right into it. Um, it is also my pleasure to introduce who is part of this panel as well and who co-authored the police reform uh, chapter with me is Clark Neely, who is the senior vice president of the Cato Institute and has done extensive work in this particular area along policing as well as other lines. So Dr. Bell, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ray, for uh, kind of kicking us off with this event. I wanna really quickly get into questions, but before I do, I just wanna remind the audience um, that uh, you can submit questions for speakers by emailing events at brookings.edu, or of course, via Twitter um, by using the hashtag, hashtag CJ reform, just as Dr. Ray was saying earlier. But yeah, so I wanna just jump right in. So the report, starts with some level setting on the structural problems that give rise to unjustified police violence and killings in an age when rates of violent crime throughout America are lower overall than they were in the 1980s and the early 1990s. One piece of this analysis that I really appreciate in your report is that it aims to disrupt the idea that black communities have higher violent crime rates because of you know, so-called culture. Um, and explains that much of the disparity in violent crime rates between predominantly white neighborhoods and predominantly black neighborhoods can be explained by neighborhood segregation, along with access to housing, education, um, and employment opportunities. 
So the report shows that disproportionate police violence against Black people is avoidable. Um, Dr. Ray, uh, would you mind expanding on this point? Sure, we, we really appreciate this question. So uh, it's complex, as Brent was saying, but if we aim to kind of simplify it into a few points, and Clark and I aim to, to highlight this in our chapter, is that part of what happens is that police are oftentimes put in positions to respond to society's social problems. They are at the forefront and oftentimes the back end of what happens in local communities. And of course, is, is no denying and everyone knows that oftentimes low income, predominantly black or brown communities are oftentimes plagued with more, uh, with more violent crime. And a lot of that of course stems from, as you noted, from a lack of access to resources and equitable resources in education and work development and infrastructure. And so as we think through this, one important point to make is that people then make the assumption that if these neighborhoods are, uh, are more violent, then we need more police presence there. When oftentimes what we need are more resources so that oftentimes police officers aren't the front line of defense or even again, the back line of trying to address some of these issues. And I think a report in Washington DC really highlights what's happening nationally. There was a report just, just released earlier this week in DC looking at use of force. And what the report found was that 91% of all use of force incidents uh, were on black residents of Washington, DC, primarily concentrated in wards six and seven, as people know who, who, are, who are from DC or who live in DC or been to DC, that's predominantly black and lower income parts of the city. Unlike say Northwest DC, which is where Brookings and AEI happen to be located. And so as we look at that, people will make assumptions. Okay, police are there to reduce crime. But then here goes the conundrum. Over 80% of the stops where there was no citation given, and in a lot of these cases, force was actually used, those people were also black, suggesting a mismatch between who police are stopping and who they perceive to be engaging in crime versus what might actually be happening in these local communities. And I think the bottom line here is this, is that as we try to lay out in this chapter and in the report, we need a comprehensive approach to not only addressing um, over-policing in local communities, but also public safety. And public safety isn't something that is solely the responsibility of law enforcement. Oftentimes it's the responsibility of municipalities and even states and the federal government to provide adequate and equitable resources as we think through this. But of course, we're here talking about police reform because we think about these racial disparities. But it's really important for people to note that those two things don't oftentimes line up. That simply because we see um, over-policing in certain communities, that doesn't mean that the people who are coming in contact with police are the ones engaging in that violent crime. And that's the conundrum that we really need to solve. Yes, yeah, so I really appreciate that um, kind of bifurcation there between higher policing and more public safety. That's really helpful. So another aspect of the report that I found to be quite brilliant is this invitation to think about police reforms that could enjoy broad support across the political spectrum that are not the same interventions that we usually hear from bipartisan commission or coalitions like banning no-knock warrants, creating national databases, and requiring body-worn cameras, which have, have kind of enjoyed a lot of bipartisan support. So the short-term reforms include uh, national training and de-escalation standards, as well as reform to the court-created doctrine of qualified immunity. So these are fascinating but thorny reforms. Uh, the deeply locally controlled uh, culture and organization of police departments make some people who really care about things like federalism balk at the idea of enforceable national standards in policing. So the report says, and I'm quoting here, police officers, regardless of whether they live in Kentucky or Arizona, need to have similar training. You know, but some people might argue that Kentucky and Arizona are actually very different places and thus might justifiably have different standards. So I wanna invite Brent in the, into the conversation here you know, this report aims to coalesce around bipartisan visions of reform. So I'm wondering, 
how would you make a case to conservatives concerned about federalism with respect to the short-term reforms in this report and really for national police reform efforts in general? What are the key lessons you've learned for how to sell these types of systemic changes to lawmakers, especially those who don't wanna look like they're weakening the police in order to, um, or in, in service of making communities less safe? Thanks, Monica. That's uh, obviously the, the question du jour, right, uh, in terms of uh, actually being able to advance legislation on police reform uh, on this topic. Um, it very much uh, hangs on this question of what the federal role actually should be. Um, uh, you know, I think that most Americans, if we can trust the opinion polling um, into it, uh, that there is a disconnect between the relative immunity of police officers and uh, the fact that they are licensed to um, as as agents of um, force in society, um, and so uh, you know, I think that uh, at the same time, you know, our perspective on this matter, and the, this is the qualified immunity issue. Um, is really informed by a world in which QI is a fact. Um, we don't like some of the outcomes that may be associated with that fact in terms of excess force and other officer-involved killings. But what we, uh, what we don't have is a memory of what the world was like before QI or what our world would look like without it. And I think it's in this context, and this goes to your question of sort of how, do, how can conservatives be brought along in this discussion um, uh, with a, a uh, keeping in mind sort of a traditional commitment to federalism. Um, I think it's very important uh, that we allow the federal system to operate as intended with states and localities leading the way on reform as they already are. I mean, as we've seen in Maryland, New York City, Colorado, other places, uh, the states and localities are already operating as laboratories of reform around this issue. Uh, and it's important that the federal government engage in this uh, as in a supporting role. Um, and let's see how those and, and see how those uh, those things work. So what is that supporting role? Uh, obviously, there are ways that the federal government could incentivize and should incentivize reform. There are ways that uh, it can support reform through policy. And then there are, um, uh, the, there's the role of evaluation. You know, what's going on in the communities that are already out ahead of the rest of the country in trying to shift policy on this issue and what lessons can they teach us? And so I think that in the context of, uh, you know, the art of the possible in terms of getting uh, a reform bill through Senator Scott, I think, who's the, you know, the linchpin of this in, uh, among Republicans in the Senate is already moving toward uh, something that kind of very closely tracks some of the recommendations that are in the report in terms of decide, it, shifting how liability is assigned um, uh, to um, in, in instances in which an officer is found to have used excessive force or violated civil rights from the officer uh, to the police department. Uh, I think that's uh, where Senator Scott is right now. Uh, that's not where the house is, but I think that gives you a sense for uh, this kind of the limits of what's possible uh, at the federal level, as well as um, you know, this issue of respecting the role of federalism in policy development. Okay, great. Yeah, so so I want to um, dig a bit deeper um, onto into qualified immunity as part of a larger conversation that many people are having. Of course, you know, Derek Chauvin and the George Floyd trial are front of mind there. Um, but a larger conversation that police uh, that people are having about police accountability for violence against racially marginalized groups. So, with respect to qualified immunity. Some people 
reject reforms, like the idea of reforms to qualified immunity, because they believe qualified immunity justifiably protects police officers from having to pay settlements for doing very difficult work or very difficult jobs. And the courts are right to have uh, very strong presumptions of deference to police officers' views about how best to conduct their work. Yet according to some research, uh, more than 60% of Americans believe that qualified immunity should be repealed. So I wanna invite Clark in here to tell us a little bit more about this issue of police accountability. So can you tell us about some of the competing interests, some of the policy interests I was talking about earlier, as well as current Current efforts in Congress and state legislatures to balance those interests and develop the best sorts of policies for accountability. You're muted. Thank you, Dr. Bill. I appreciate that. Rookie error. I actually unmuted and I just missed the button. So thanks so much for this question. Thank, uh, thanks to uh, um, Brent and to uh, Rashawn for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. Um, you know, a lot of this is a balancing act, but there still have to be some things that are non-negotiable. And accountability is one of those things. Uh, there was a Gallup poll last August that indicated that public confidence in police is the lowest that it has ever been since it has been measured. Uh, that is unsustainable. Uh, police are not able to do their jobs when the public doesn't have confidence in them. People will not cooperate with them. People try to stay away from them. So that is unsustainable in the long term. And we've got to restore public confidence in the police as an institution. That is simply not possible if there is a widespread perception that police are insufficiently accountable. And I think it's clear that there is. The cornerstone uh, of our accountability policy for police is, of course, the federal law that Congress enacted in 1871 in the wake of the Civil War in the midst of widespread civil rights violations by government actors in the South. Today, we refer to that law as Section 1983, and it provides people with the ability to sue government officials who violate their rights. The problem is that the Supreme Court invented out of whole cloth this doctrine of qualified immunity um, that very simply enables a government official who has committed a rights violation, not an alleged rights violation, but who actually has violated somebody's rights, to nevertheless get that case thrown out of court simply because there's not a pre-existing court case with essentially identical facts where the courts have already said, look, you cannot put your knee on a restrained suspect's neck for not and a half minutes until you kill that person. That's not permitted. If that case is not already on the books, then qualified immunity will be granted and the police officer who committed that act will escape financial liability to the victim. That is untenable. So then the question becomes, what should qualified immunity reform look like? And then it becomes a balancing act, as Brent suggested a moment ago. Um, two things I think are true. People need to know that wherever they go in the country, they still enjoy the same civil rights as, the, as everybody else does. In other words, whether or not a police officer um, can uh, tase you while, while you are in handcuffs does not depend on whether you're in New York at the time or whether you're in Texas or some other state. Or to take an image from a recent disturbing video that was released, Rochester police um, were responding to an incident where a nine-year-old girl was having an emotional incident. She was very agitated. They put her in handcuffs. And when she would not slide quickly enough into the squad car, they sprayed pepper spray right into her eyeballs. Whether or not there, there's accountability for that act does, should not depend on whether it took place in Rochester or New Orleans or Miami. So that's one baseline, is that our rights have to be protected no matter where we are in the country. What we can experiment with, and what Brent suggested a moment ago, um, is in effect how we implement this accountability. All victims have to have access to a civil process for pursuing a damages remedy. One question that is very much a live question now is, if that victim does get a monetary recovery, where should it come from? Um, the law enforcement lobby is proposing uh, a policy that may or may not be embraced by the Republicans. We really still don't know exactly what their what their um, uh, you know preferred policy is, whereby the officer who committed the rights violation will be completely let off the hook financially, and all of the damages for that misconduct will be laid on the taxpayers um, through employer liability. Uh, I strongly reject uh, that approach. I think it does not provide for accountability. I think the individual needs to remain accountable and liable, um, but certainly an approach that uh, envisions kind of joint and several liability, where the employer and the officer 
officer are equally liable um, is one that um, I think a lot of people would support across, well, hopefully on both sides of the aisle. Final point. Um, what we want to avoid is um, a kind of a one size fits all uh, that requires, for example, every single police department in the country to pick up the tab for even the most egregious misconduct of individual officers. That is a, the kind of one size fits all policy that is, I think, absolutely inappropriate uh, for this uh, uh, you know, challenge of accountability. So final point leave states and local governments some room uh, to experiment and to develop best practices, but not at the expense of ensuring individuals that their rights are equally protected no matter where they go in the country, no matter what the color of their skin, no matter what neighborhood they happen to be in when they encounter a police officer. Thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful, a really helpful way of thinking about the relationship between uh, federalism, I think, and, um, and, and, you know, our rights being protected across, across the nation, uh, the nation and our kind of constitutional um, purview. So, um, you know, there is so much that one could ask about in this report, um, and I, but I want to get into some of the long-term uh, reforms you propose. And so, you know, uh, one of them, uh, changing police culture, is one of the hardest in my estimation in at least two senses. So first, it's hard because there aren't really metrics for police culture in the way that there are metrics for a lot of the other outcomes that we tend to focus on in policy spaces and circles. So it's really hard to know how one would measure or understand whether an effort to change police culture has been successful or not. So that's, that's one challenge. I think probably the bigger one, um, it, you know, it may be that police culture, however one might define it, is not actually changeable at a massive scale. So I'm thinking here about the work of former Baltimore Police Chief Anthony Batts, who poured significant effort and leadership uh, into trying to change the culture of the Baltimore Police Department um, from 2012 to 2015, before the death of Freddie Gray um, and before he left the post. So Batts spoke out this past October and described the culture of the Baltimore Police Department in his, in his words as, quote, one of the most battered police organizations I've seen in my career, and it would take building from the ground up. So he didn't blame the officers. He talked about how some of the, the officers were great, but he blamed the, the systems that were surrounding them. And, you know, this is not a really dissimilar critique from a lot of the criticisms of Black Lives Matter activists, um, activists in support of defunding and even wor working toward the abolition of police. So while these ideas might seem unreasonable to some people, the basic claim um, of those activists is not too different from the critique that Chief Batts uh, was offering, which is that individual police officers might be nice people, might have good intentions, um, but the systems in which they are operating are just too broken to fix. So Rayshawn, I just asked Brent, and Clark to respond to some of the critiques of some of the, pro the proposed reforms uh, in the report from the right. Uh, I wanna ask you about some critiques from the left that some of these reforms might just not be achievable uh, even if they are long-term proposals. So how would you respond to those criticisms and really bringing in one of the audience member questions here, you know, they asked, how do we break through entrenched police culture to make the reforms needed to save lives from unnecessary police violence? And I'm just kind of tacking on here as someone who's empathetic to these types of arguments. Um, how possible is that? And how will we know if we've achieved that goal? Well, I think, I mean, look, you, you just have the, the best questions, I must say. All of us have been saying that. I think the big thing, and in, in former Chief Batts um, highlighted this, I want to make a few central points. The first thing is once we get past sound bites, once we get past slogans, if you really listen to what people are saying, they're saying similar things. Like what former Chief Bats said, as you noted, is right in line with what activists and others have been saying. And once we get past that and we actually read and we actually hear people in depth about what they're saying, that's important. And thinking about Baltimore, and I've done a lot of work on policing in Baltimore with our virtual reality training program that we have at the University of Maryland in the Lab for Applied Social Science Research. And one of the big things that I think about when I hear Chief Bat's comments is something that uh, Dr. Otis Johnson, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore said on a panel that I was on with him recently. He said, I'm unsure if culture is reformable. I'm unsure if culture is reformable. Now, 
as a sociologist and a structuralist, I think, oh, that's interesting. This is, you know, kind of a, a theoretical way in which we think about it, about the relationship between structure and culture. But when I think practically, and I've worked with thousands of police officers around the country, dozens of police departments, it speaks to something that I say often, and I'm going to uh, try to try to succinctly explain it. One thing that I say often is that bad apples come from rotten trees and policing. See, one of the notions is that these bad apples like Derek Chauvin or the officer that Clark talked about in Rochester or the other ones we can mention, that some kind of way they're just isolated. And the, all the research I've done on policing shows that that's not the case at all. And part of the embedded assumption about bad apples is that some sort of way that the system is alleviated and also that good apples can some kind of way take up the slack for all those bad apples and overcome them. And that is not what happens at all. In fact, what I find, like when people make the statement, overwhelmingly, there are good officers. And, and for some reason, people always feel the need to say that, to, to make that statement. Well, yeah, that's a given. Like, we shouldn't have to say that. It's not about the good ones, right? That's not who we're talking about. But one thing about the good ones that I found is that good apples oftentimes get pushed down and pushed out. What do I mean by that? Officers who oftentimes intervene, who feel as if they have a duty to report, even if there isn't a law in the books for it, I find that they oftentimes get stigmatized. They're more likely to be demoted. They're less likely to be promoted. I've seen them transferred out to the farthest district away from their house, put on night shift. Like these are messages. Not only are these messages to that officer, it's messages to other officers about the blue wall of silence. See, the blue wall of silence exists not just because officers want to be loyal, but it also exists because there are dire consequences for officers' livelihoods if they try to crack it. The other thing I found is that officers are pushed out, like the officer in Buffalo, New York, who, who literally essentially jumped on her partner's back to stop him from doing what could have been a George Floyd situation. After 19 years on the force, she got fired and just recently got her pension back. I could go to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I could go to St. Louis, Missouri and talk about all these so-called good apples that have been pushed down and pushed out. And only when you start to look at the system that part of one of the ways that we can actually address this is to do a couple of things you mentioned. The first big thing is to alter the metrics of success. See, in policing, we pretty much have all the data on deficits. But when's the last time anyone's seen a stat about how many conversations a police officer had throughout the day? How many times they helped someone who was lost? How many times they helped someone in need? We don't have those metrics. Instead, we have all these negative metrics, use of force, how many times they pulled their gun, how many stops they made, how many tickets they gave. And when you have a deficit model of success, then people see that. I've seen it highlighted on dozens of police departments around the country where you go in and it has a bulletin board of how many arrests people have made, how many stops they've made, how many citations they've given out. Those are the metrics of success. So we have to change that. And one of the ways that we outline in our chapter that we think we can change it is not only in restructuring qualified immunity, but also in having police department insurance policies and police officer malpractice insurance. Now, there are a few examples already. The big one is in the state of Colorado, where what they have is they're moving toward a police department insurance model and then also officers having liability insurance up to a certain amount so that they take some culpability and accountability for the actions they have. That's a shared model. I think Minneapolis uh, is going to move toward that model. Of course, they're, they're having a lot, of, a lot of issues, but they're trying. They, they've talked about that particular plan as well. I think New York will probably explore that in some way. And what this looks like, I want people to think about this. If you are a physician, if you're a lawyer, if you are uh, a plumber, if you're an electrician, you have liability insurance. And so the point is that we don't want to see police officers uh, having to so-called go in their pockets to get that, even so, though some people would see that. Oftentimes, they don't even have the finances to do that. So, so that wouldn't be uh, a pathway that, that would be useful even for victims' families. But if you had an insurance model, what would happen is that the police department would take some accountability and the individual officer would take some accountability. And we actually have some examples for this. Small departments, see there are 18,000 police departments in the country um, or law enforcement agencies, let me phrase it that way, in the country. Most of which are small. They're like in the heat of the night. 
So if, if you were like me and you grew up watching that show, most of them are around, you know, 10 offices. They're not Chicago and New York. And so part of thinking about that is they have to take on risk in some way. And they take that risk on by forming a risk pool with similarly situated municipalities, small places. And what research tells us is that the ones that have that, we've seen officers and departments be held accountable, such as in East Tennessee, where two officers beat up a, 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 a motorist who was on a motorcycle and the insurance company came back and said, your department is costing us too much money. You either have to let these officers go or we're going to drop you from the risk pool. Well, it also had implications for other departments because they were part of that risk pool. On the other end of the spectrum, you have entire departments that have kind of had a series of incidents like a department in the suburbs of Los Angeles and the insurance company said, we can no longer keep you insured. So similar to people thinking about when you turn 16 or 17 or 18 and you got insurance and all of a sudden you had an accident or you got speeding tickets, your insurance increased. Well, that increased your risk. We should have that same approach to law enforcement. And this is why, because Clark says something that was really important for people to, to, to recognize here. When we start talking about civilian settlements for police misconduct, in the past five years, taxpayers in only the major 20 metro areas have spent out over $2 billion in civil settlements. It doesn't come from the police department budget. It comes from the general funds, money that could be going toward education and work infrastructure that would actually reduce crime in, 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 uh, in impoverished communities. In places like Chicago, not only do they appropriate money, but they don't even have the money to cover it. So they take out bonds, what people actually call police brutality bonds. Like this is the current model. It's very clear it's not working. And look, it's very clear that at the federal level, Senator Tim Scott has said, I think we're going to be able to figure out qualified immunity. I think we're at that point when it's kicked back to states and localities, which, of course, uh, Republicans will want to allow states to have control, municipalities to have control. We're going to see a lot of different models. Some won't change, some will. But for the ones that, that should change, because what should happen is they should create a police department insurance policy and have officers take liability insurance like the Colorado model. Great. That's, that's really, that's really great. Um, I want to bring Brendan here. I think you have a comment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and or Rayshawn, thank you for that uh, amazing uh, uh, overview of some of the really key policy questions that we're grappling with and, and what the data actually is telling us about uh, bad apples and bad trees. Um, but on this issue of uh, culture, I agree completely that a culture trumps almost everything um, when it comes to um, all of life. You know, these, these are our embedded assumptions, our ways of looking at the world. Uh, I certainly think that's true of policing um, and that it's a very difficult thing to change. In my, in my day job, I focus on workforce development issues um, and thinking about uh, the role that work has in providing meaning in people's lives, uh, how it helps to foster a sense of identity, uh, how it anchors us and connects us to other people. And I think we can see all of that at work in what um, you and Monica were both talking about in terms of the way that police forces operate. Um, there, there are codes written and unwritten. Um, and, I, and I think that one thing that I've observed in kind of my reading on police reform is that um, officers need support in developing more of a sense of vocation for what they do. Uh, and not uh, it, it, the vocation should not stop at maintenance of order or uh, uh, punishment of wrongdoers, right? The, the actual mandate of police forces is to serve and protect. That's what police forces do. That's what they're supposed to do anyway. And developing a sense, a greater sense of vocation among officers, I think is vital uh, in, the, in the training and development process. This is hard work. It's very difficult work. It's sometimes very dangerous work. And, and officers need that sense of uh, not just their obligations to their fellow officers, but 
the obligation that they take on to themselves in serving the communities that they police. Um, so second thing, and this I'll, I'll stop after this, but uh, in terms of rebuilding from the ground up, we do have one locality that has kind of done this, uh, Camden, New Jersey, uh, in terms of really rebuilding the entire force uh, from the ground up with different rules of engagement or uh, use of force policies, uh, you know, different, different everything, a real shift to community policing. And so uh, is it hard? Yes, it's extremely hard. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done, but it requires leadership uh, and it especially requires leadership at the local level. Thanks. I think I think all of these comments about vocation, about what it takes, like organizationally, to achieve some of these goals, really give us some space to think about one of the other long-term proposals um, discussed in the report, and that is the restructuring or regulations of contracts um, with um, the Fraternal Order of Police. So, if you think about um, questions of vocation and like what 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 policing is to people who work in it, um, unions, um, police unions play a big uh, role there. Um, so one of our audience members asked relatedly to this, um, whether police officers bill, bill of rights should be removed across the country. Um, as we all know, um, Maryland, which is the first state to incorporate uh, a law enforcement officer's bill of rights into state law just repealed that law over Governor Hogan's veto. So I wanna invite Clark in here to, to, to let us know a little bit about how we should think about police officers' uh, Bill of Rights in, as part of this larger ambition that, that the report office offers around regulating FOP contracts. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I think this is a really important point. Um, for people who don't know, uh, there are these um, contracts that are referred to colloquially as a law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights. Um, and the protections that they provide to police are really quite stunning in many cases. To take just one example of a very common provision, um, an officer who's involved in a use of force incident cannot be questioned by uh, the internal affairs uh, officers in his own department um, un un until he's had several days to reflect, and in some cases, until they have disclosed to the officer all of the evidence that was gathered from the scene, whether it's video recordings, witness statements, or so forth. So it's very obvious why this would be a problem. And it's also very obvious why law enforcement would never let a suspect outside of the law enforcement community uh, have access to all of the evidence that has been gathered so that they can craft their story uh, and make it consistent with the, uh, you know, the documentary evidence. So that's just one example. Let's talk a little bit about what we know in terms of, of actual empirical data. Um, there was a study from December of last year um, that was able to take advantage of a kind of a natural experiment in Florida where sheriff's officers are permitted to organize, uh, but regular police officers are not. And so you had the ability to study two similarly situated populations. The only major major difference being that one was unionized and the other wasn't. And the study concluded that there was a substantial increase in violent misconduct when the sheriff's officers were permitted to unionize. And this is not surprising. We know, for example, that it took more than five years to fire Daniel Pantaleo, the officer who killed Eric Garner with an illegal chokehold in New York. And we also still have, do not know why Derek Chauvin was on the Minneapolis police force after more than 17 use of force complaints against him, including some involving the forbidden asphyxiation technique that he used to murder George Floyd. Somebody really needs to answer for that. And, and to my, as best I can tell, no one has uh, been required to answer for that. Um, one of the ironies, uh, I would say, of this, of this uh, issue is that one of the things that is the least controversial in criminal justice circles is that in order for punishment to be effective, it must be swift and certain. Uh, and that's a mantra among members of law enforcement with respect to criminals. But what we know is that when police engage in misconduct, particularly when they're protected by a police officer's union, uh, accountability is neither swift nor certain. Um, it takes an incredibly long time to go through the process. We've seen example after example where police officers who've been fired by their own leadership are then rehired after an arbitration. Um, and so in this context, unfortunately, as I said, accountability is neither swift nor certain. And uh, these police officer law enforcement bill of rights and unionizing uh, has a, a huge role to play in that. And I think the evidence is now quite clear uh, that allowing 
police uh, to unionize um, was the wrong policy and it's time to roll it back the way they did in Maryland. Great, yeah. So, so yeah, we have one audience question that I wanna bring in before the final question. And um, so, so a member of the audience asked uh, why there can't be a police national organization setting standards um, and, and you know, compared, compared to like how lawyers have the ABA and doctors have the American Medical Association. You know, I was thinking, you know, we have things like PERF, like the Police Executive Research Forum that do kind of come up with national um, ideas, but it does seem true. Like setting aside that there may, like maybe arguably there is some sort of national organization setting some sorts of standards. They don't have the same type of hold over the culture of local police departments that, you know, the ABA does with, with lawyers or the AMA has with doctors. So I, I invite whoever wants to talk about that question. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to throw it open. It's just an audience question. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's clear that there need to be some national standards and this is a bipartisan issue. I mean, Republicans and Democrats agree on this. Um, last summer is one of the things that they wanted. And, and, and again, when we look at um, kind of the Senate package that the Republicans put together led by uh, Tim Scott and then the, the House package led by Congresswoman Karen Bass, and I analyzed both of the policies. I mean, they agree on rough, I mean, about 10 things. The, the big thing that's different is the qualified immunity part. And I think that they that they figured out how to address that. And one of the big things they agree on are having national standards. And part of the reason why, and um, Monica, this goes back to something you said earlier, you know, thinking about what happens in Kentucky compared to another state. Well, look, people are quite uh, migrant people in the United States today. Whereas we go back decades before, probably oftentimes because of limited transportation, people didn't go that far from where they lived. Now in the same day, you can hop on a plane, go from California to DC, travel around and go back and be home for dinner on the West Coast. So, so part of thinking about these national standards are, is really, really important. The other thing that's really important, and this is one thing that the state of Maryland, um, well, I should say that, that the Democratic caucus really pushed for that ended up not passing, but it's really important, is the duty to intervene uh, legislation. And it's because of what I was saying earlier about good and bad apples. See, what needs to happen is that these good apples who want to report need to be able to report to an independent body, which I think could be at the state level. But it's clear that it doesn't need to be at the municipal level because too many people know one another. And when things route through internal affairs that way, it can lead to a series of things happening. And I, I've seen it, I, I've, I've analyzed it. And so that becomes one of the really important things to do. The other thing about rebuilding, which is how I like how Brent really put that, when we think about the rebuilding process, Part of thinking about rebuilding is to look at Camden as a model. Not only did they almost, I think, basically have zero police killings in 2020, but their homicide clearance rate was over 90%. You know what that tells me? They have community trust. Like not only were homicides down, but they also have community trust. So we have these models out here, but national standards are really important, not only for um, having federal databases for bad apples, so that what, what Clark was saying, we can't have an officer like Timothy Lohman jump to his third police department after killing 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland. We also need these databases for use of force. Because look, we know how many people get the flu every year. We don't know how many people get killed by the police. Like that's a travesty. Like the CDC actually collects data on how many people get killed by jellyfish. But we don't know about police. And it's not because police departments don't want to submit this information. It's because oftentimes they're small under-resourced, don't have the skill set to do so. So leveraging resources from the federal level, creating federal standards, we not only think about training, but also think about how we compile better data to have municipalities, working with researchers, local think tanks and activist organizations. That is how community trust is built. That's what Camden did when it rebuilt itself. And now look at what it's doing. And in a pandemic where violent crime skyrocketed, it went down in Camden. We have to ask ourselves why that's the case. And that's because they rebuilt something that included everyone and they did it right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And I, I think it's a really great segue to my final question. We have, you know, about six minutes left. And I wanna ask 
each one of you this question that is also inspired by one of the pre-submitted audience questions. So we have a lot of differently positioned people here uh, watching this webinar, some of whom work in police and policy spaces like all of us, um, but some of whom are just you know regular folks who want to contribute in their communities and to this kind of deep and important project of changing our current policing structure. So to each one of you, and I'll, I'll go through, I'll, I'll go Clark, Brent, Rayshawn, um, what can citizens and local communities do to educate themselves about the structural problems with policing and to advocate for the type of change that we've talked about thus far today? So I'll start with Clark. Thanks so much. I think this is where, the, where it really has to happen. Um, obviously, um, we are a democracy and in a democracy, the police work for us and we need to make sure that that is um, not just understood, not sort of imposed, but that that's part of the ethic uh, that people um, who work in law enforcement um, honor um, and embrace that principle. Um, and I think there are two things that are really important here. Um, the first is that no matter how frustrated you might be um, with policing, um, with systemic problems that we've been discussing, it is not constructive to simply throw rocks and to say that, you know, all police um, are terrible people um, or that, um, you know, we should just uh, fire them all and, and, you know, not have a police force. I don't think that's really very helpful. It's not very constructive. And it certainly doesn't um, motivate uh, the people on the inside, people within law enforcement uh, to, to want to change uh, their uh, outlook or their behavior. Um, so I think what's better is to, um, if, you're, if you're somebody who wants to change the culture, um, figure out a fairly discrete issue. It could be qualified immunity. It could be this problem that Rashawn just told us about with the failure to collect data about uh, use of force and really develop um, some expertise on that subject so that you can speak credibly about it and then reach out and engage constructively uh, with your local leaders, um, with uh, your, your mayor, if, if you live in a city, uh, with your state uh, representatives um, and um, engage with them constructively and try to be um, a source of, of, of positive influence and useful information. Um, and I think that, that people who uh, basically position themselves as police haters and don't have anything more to say than that um, really limit their ability to influence the, the process and, and the the outcomes. And I'll say one more thing. We've been talking about Camden a lot. And I just want to uh, throw a shout out to my friend Scott Thompson, um, who was the police chief uh, in Camden from 2008 until last year and, uh, you know, really oversaw a lot of this uh, uh, shift in culture there. And I think deserves a lot of credit for that. And, and I agree with, with everything that Rashawn said. It is really a shining example of what's possible and, and an inspiration um, uh, along the lines of what Brent told us. We should not give up on this. This problem is fixable and we can do it. Thanks so much. You know, I think it's, it's interesting, too, to think about like the role of various types of activism in changing, not just the what what people do at a local level inside, but also um, how people are motivated to even care about these issues. So, you know, and, and how people kind of change the politics of police reform. So so it's like the police haters may not be influential in terms of the inside and like policies that get done, but they may well be, have a lot of influence in terms of changing the larger political conversation we're having. So I really appreciate what you said. Uh, Brent? I don't think I have tons to add. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I was reflecting on, um, uh, you know, sort of some of the things that Clark and Rishon have said um, on this. Um, I think there's a fundamental problem um, with uh, issues of trust. Um, it's not just the police, it's, it, it's endemic in our society right now and we see it uh, in, in relation to the to police. And so I think, um, you know, focusing on the rebuilding of trust between police departments and communities is probably the single most important thing that can be done in order to um, reach the twin goals, right? Uh, safe and, uh, or the, the goals of a, a society that's safe and fair and just uh, and um, promotes well-being in, uh, inside the community. Trust is absolutely essential. And so that kind of, uh, we can't legislate trust. We can't, um, we can't require it. We can't, uh, we can't even buy it. You know, it's got to be generated and developed mainly through leadership. And so that's what I think, um, you know, what local communities ought to be focusing on is the question of how to either rebuild or build up trust between their police departments and the communities that are most in need of good policing. Um, 
you know, we don't want to expose these communities to more violence, to more crime. Um, uh, and we, we won't have advanced the prospects of the people who live in those communities if we just trade uh, police violence for criminal violence. That's neither of those things are OK. Um, and so that that's what I would I, I would really focus on that trust factor. OK, Dr. Ray, you're going to last word for us. Thank you. OK, so I, I'll be quick as we transition. So I completely agree with what's been said. I think it's five specific things. First thing is read. A lot of researchers, a lot of practitioners like ourselves have done a lot of work on this. And oftentimes I hear people making statements and I think it's mostly because I'm an academic and I'm like that not only is that not true, like that's like, like I've never read anything like that unless you're just reading something randomly that someone says. So, so read, get up to speed as Clark was saying, if you know if it's overwhelming, take a deep dive on one issue. The second thing is you wanna think about how your tax money is being used. Look at your locality figure out how the money is being used. If you have a problem with some of the things we said about how your tax money is being used, and I think people on the right and the left do, well then contribute, go to city council meetings, go to state to the late state legislature and hear how your money is being used and help think through other ways. Third thing, um, become part of, of uh, actually go through the Civilian Police Academy. I think oftentimes people don't have a really good understanding of what police officers do and why they do it. Um, I come from a law enforcement family. My great uncle was the first black chief of police in my hometown. I have another uncle that's a cop. I have a cousin that's a cop. I come from a, a military family. I'm, I'm the different one in my family. I, I just stayed in school. And so thinking through that, um, if you don't have that experience, then you want to level up. You want to know why officers do what they do. This is how we get to policy instead of overly focusing on the people because police officers oftentimes do what they're trained to do and what they have the allowances to do. So if you have a problem with that, think about changing the policy. Final two points relate to embedding yourself in local communities. There are communities that are simultaneously over-policed and have high crime. And if you've never been in one of those communities, if you're not from them, if you don't understand them, you need to go there so that you can better understand what's happening. Not only will you see that they are just amazingly good people in those communities, you will also see, uh, Monica, as you were saying, that there were that there are activists literally trying to do that work. There are violence disruptors who are not only thinking about over policing, but they're just thinking about gun violence in their communities. Like one of the biggest fallacies I hear all the time is some kind of way people don't care about violent crime in their communities. I'm like. You, you can't be from those communities to say that because I'm from those communities and people care about it because it's their family members being hit. And then the final thing is community oversight boards, which I think should be big. And it's not just about symbolic representation of having the board to exist. It's playing a role on the misconduct board within the police department. That's what Maryland's doing. That's what DC's doing. That's what some of these other places are doing. Nashville, I think is the model for that, uh, led by Jill, by Jill Fitchard. And so when we think about those models, that's how you get police officers and community members to the table at the same time. Well, thank all three of you for your work on this report and I'm happy to turn, uh, help us turn to the next panel. Awesome. So as we transition, uh, Monica and Clark, thank you all so much for being a part of this. This was great. Clark, it's been great working with you. Monica, thank you for your expertise. It is simply phenomenal. I also want to tell uh, the viewers that they can uh, submit questions for speaking, for, for the speakers, by emailing events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at CJ Reform. So I, wanna, I now wanna introduce, um, in addition to having Brent on this panel, uh, two of our other panelists who helped to co-author the pretrial sentencing chapter, which was so important to this volume. First, Dr. Pamela Lattimore, who is the Senior Director of Research Development for the Division for Applied Justice Research at R RTI International has extensive experience on Capitol Hill as well. And Dr. Matthew uh, D. Michelle, who is the senior research sociologist at RTI International and who has worked on this issue for a myriad of time. So I wanna get straight into this uh, conversation. And the first question I have is you all start off your, your chapter with a powerful statement. You say the roots of mass incarceration in the United States lie in policies and practices that result in jail for millions of individuals charged with crimes, but not convicted of any crime and often or a lengthy prison sentence for those who actually get convicted. So I think when people hear that statement, they think, wow, so, so I may be, you know, I think a lot of people make the assumption that most people are in prison or in jails because they've actually been convicted. 
instead of being in jail in prison because either they can't afford their bail or their hearing has been delayed or something along those lines. So Pam, can you unpack that statement for us and talk to us kind of through that pretrial process? Uh, sure, Rayshawn, I'm happy to do that. And first I'd like to give a shout out to Cassia Swan, who was a, the third co-author on our chapter. Uh, she wasn't able to be with us today, but she's a well-known sentencing expert and we really appreciate her contributions to our chapter. I think the first thing that I'd like to, to say is to, I, I, you know, a lot of people don't really think about how people end up in jails and prisons. And, you know, it, it seems like it's just a natural sort of thing that, well, there are laws and these laws result in people in certain actions happening, but actually deliberate policy and practice choices lie at the root of, of how people are punished. And uh, one way to look at that is to say, well, what's the incarceration rate in the United States compared to our peer nations? And the incarceration rate in the United States is much, much higher than it is in you know, the United Kingdom and Germany and Australia and Canada. And, and it, that's a result of specific policy choices that have been made and the ena enactment of laws and then how those laws are, are put into place. And a lot of this is in response. I really appreciated your comments, Rashawn, about uh, obviously people in these neighborhoods care about violence, right? The violence that's being commuted in their, in, in their communities. And if we look back about 50 or 60 years ago to the emergence of sort of the war on drugs and the war on crime, and you know the, the the Crime Act, the 1994 Crime Act, was in response to concerns about about the level of violence in these communities that was brought forward not just by people on the outside, but also obviously very much by the people who were inside those communities and, and dealing with excessive violence in their streets. And um, and so a series of laws were put into place to to try to address that, to try to address violent crime, to try to address drug crime, and so forth. A lot of those laws were associated with pretty draconian sentences by what you would attach to the rest of the world, right? You know, 20 years for the possession of a small amount of drugs, for example. I mean, in Germany, a 20 year sentence is almost unheard of for any kind of crime. And so, you know, the result of this was in the mid 1970s, there were about 200,000 people in prison in the United States. In 2019, there were 1.4 million. And I'm always quick to point out, because a lot of my research is focused on community corrections, that this five, six, seven fold increase in correctional populations just didn't happen because we moved people from probation to prison. Actually, there was a five, six, seven fold increase in the number of people who were being supervised in the communities. And as a result, you know, we ended up, you know, in, in terms of post sentencing, people spending very, very long times in, in, in prison after they were sentenced. But on the front end of the system, what we ended up with was a, a, a basically a preference for holding people in jail until they could go to trial. And so somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the people sitting in most jails in the United States, and there's over close to 750,000 of them today, uh, about two thirds to three quarters of those individuals have not been convicted at this point of anything. Uh, they're sitting there awaiting trial. And they're, awaiting, and they're sitting there awaiting trial because they can't afford to pay a bondsman most of the time to pay a bondsman to uh, to allow them to be released pre-trial, and so again, these are deliberate choices. You know, a a, a, a twenty thousand uh, dollar you know bond placed on someone with a minor charge, they have to come up with two thousand dollars to get out of jail uh, pre-trial. They're never getting that two thousand dollars back, and uh, and so you know, there's a gross. They're never getting it back, even if the charges are dropped. Right? I mean, uh, people don't realize that, you know, they paid $2,000 to get out of jail. So, you know, you know, there's, 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 you know, those issues and all of these things are a direct result of policy choices that are made by lawmakers uh, in, in terms of how we're going to handle this and local practices in terms of who we're going to keep in jail. Yeah, thank you for that. I, uh, Bill Galston and I, who's a senior fellow at Brookings, we wrote about the 1994 crime bill and we highlight that, look, there were people in local communities Oftentimes in, in democratic centers, uh, black politicians, black people in local communities who wanted to see something done with crime. And then of course the outcome was ju just a dire stat that mm -hmm. particularly in the nineties, one out of three black males uh, could be expected to be incarcerated on parole or have a previous criminal record. And I think most people, for most people's social networks, it played out that way, and including for mine. Um, and we could think about the differences between the way that drugs are handled 
today compared to how they were handled then. And, and so, Matthew, I want to ask you, we, we heard in the first panel about policing and, and particularly, of course, we, we didn't talk a lot about police stops per se, but of course, that typically starts the process. And but we talked about the ways that policing could be reformed and improved. Can you kind of walk us through what happens? So after this police contact, what happens after someone is arrested and kind of highlight some key statistics about the gravity of pretrial detention and incarceration? Yeah, most definitely. And before I start, I want to thank uh, Brookings and AEI for pulling together this, you know, really tremendous report and for including us in the report and also pulling together this webinar today. It's a great opportunity uh, to get to talk with everybody um, online today. Um, and I'm going to start, uh, Rishan, by answering your question by kind of starting with the punchline of what I'd like to get to from my presentation today, just in general, this conversation. And that's really to, to reframe pretrial detention and to really recognize it as there's very little positive side to pretrial detention. Mm -hmm. There are very few social benefits to incarcerating people um, prior to a conviction, prior to their adjudication, um, but yet we do it overwhelmingly. Um, and why do I say that there's very little positive side? Because pretrial release decisions are often referred to as the most consequential decisions in the criminalizing process. And why do we say they're the most the most consequential? Uh, we say that because individuals that are detained, detained pretrial are more likely to be charged with serious crimes. Individuals uh, detained pretrial once charged are more likely to be convicted. Uh, once convicted, they're more likely to be incarcerated, to give us a sentence of incarceration as opposed to a community sentence, and more likely to recidivate uh, once released. So it, not only are there few positive <laughs> sides to pretrial detention, there are a host of negative consequences for individuals, families, and communities and society writ large. And they go along with some of the, the, the information that Pam was just telling you, and that what we know is that there are about 11 million bookings every year. So about 9 million people probably are brought through jails each year. Uh, law enforcement officers arrest them on the street and bring them to the, the many jails that are operated in our cities and counties across the country. Um, and like you just heard, there's about 750,000 people that are locked up uh, in jails right now. Um, and about two thirds of them are being held pretrial. So right now, as all of us are sitting on this webinar, there are about a half a million adults in the United States that are sitting in jails across the country, uh, mostly because they couldn't afford bail. And so when we talk about the process that people face when they're going forward uh, to be released or to, to be granted pretrial release, um, what we know is about 4% of individuals are actually denied release. So 96% of the individuals are not denied release. And those 4% typically are really serious crimes, mostly capital offenses. Uh, but we do know people that are charged with manslaughter and homicides you know, can be released as well. We saw uh, Derek Chauvin in Minnesota had been released on bail and several others have as well, uh, when, if they can come up with the amount of money. Um, but one of the keys to being released pretrial is a tool known as a bail schedule. And bail schedules are essentially um, a, a piece of paper or, or kind of you know, heavy stock cardboard, if you will, uh, that has a couple of columns on it that has information. And on one side is, is a, the, a statute or a charge. And on the other side is a dollar value that goes with that. So it can be a, you know, 500 for a certain level misdemeanors, 1,000, 5,000, whatever it might be. And, and so what we know is that about 70% of the people that come through the court system or through the pretrial system are offered bail. But what we know is about 65% of people are being detained uh, with the bulk of them being pretrial detainees. So we know that about 90% of the individuals that are being held in jails right now are being held there because they can't afford bail. And very often these bails are relatively small amounts of money because I think when we're talking about pretrial reform and talking about the pretrial process, we need to think about the nature of the folks that are coming through our system. We know that pretrial detention is not distributed evenly across society. We know that the folks that are being detained are the most vulnerable. Uh, they tend to be from communities of color. They tend to be people that are suffering homelessness and other kind of co-occurring issues. So uh, what, what I'd like to talk about today is how we can work towards facilitating pretrial release for more people. So thinking about how pretrial decisions are made to broaden that net to um, actually allow more individuals to be released. Yeah, Matthew, thanks for that. I mean, that was that was some great detail. And it also speaks to a question that we got that I quickly want to ask Brent about because I think it's relevant now. So Luz Rooney from the United Nations Association 
of the USA wants to know kind of the status of COVID in prison. So Brent, I know uh, we wrote about this last year with, with some people actually from the working group, uh, John Eason and Howard Henderson. Have things changed with COVID in prisons? I mean, we know that COVID is reducing overall in the United States while it's increasing in other places, but are prisons and prison towns still being hit hard by COVID? Was that actually ever addressed? Uh, I, you know, it's a big country. So uh, yes, in some places it was addressed. Uh, some, uh, some jurisdictions um, have been very active in trying to get vaccines into prisons. Others uh, less so, um, frankly. Um, uh, and the way that, that in our piece and uh, that we wrote and in other pieces that I've written, um, we've tried to th talk about this is we need to not think about uh, them as prisoners, but as members of the community that are simply isolated in a different congregate setting, right? It's, it's no different really than nursing homes um, or any other setting where you have a lot of people in crowded conditions, some of whom are very vulnerable um, to COVID. So we've, we've seen some improvement, but it's been slow. Uh, I, I guess now we've got enough vaccines that really anybody who wants one um, ought to be able to have it uh, in fairly short order. But I do think that early on in the crisis, uh, you know, the, the, the prison population is always relatively uh, invisible to us. Uh, we don't think about them. Uh, and that was certainly true in this crisis. Some jurisdictions tried to move people out, reduce uh, populations, uh, uh, and would probably need to look at how well that worked. Um, but I, overall, I would say that um, it's, it's been a very slow process of kind of bringing uh, the risk that prisoners face from COVID uh, into the, the public mind and into the minds of our ele uh, elected officials who oversee these vaccination programs. Yeah, I mean, as you know, I mean, people think about these prisons as isolated places. And oftentimes we, we don't really think of incarcerated people as, as, full, as fully human oftentimes, but it spills over into local communities because you oftentimes have uh, prisons that are in particular areas and towns where a lot of people work at the prison or are affiliated with it and being exposed to it. We, we just got another really, uh, I think, poignant question from Naeem Banks that asked about the public defense system and public defenders, noting that public defenders are vastly underfunded um, and mostly represent Black people and, under, and other uh, marginalized groups who oftentimes can't afford legal counsel. So this is kind of speaking to what Matthew was saying about who can afford certain things when it comes to the criminal justice system. So the impact that public defense can have on lowering the incarceration rate is largely often overlooked. How can the public defender system play a role in shifting the conversation and play a role in criminal justice reform? And I'll, I'll open that up to whomever wants to start, Matthew, Pam, Brent. I, you know, I can, I'll, I'll start and then maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Um, I, I, it's, it's an interesting question for, um, for Matthew and me because we live in North Carolina, which doesn't have a statewide public defender uh, system. And so there's a public defender office that operates in some counties and, uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, almost a pro bono, you know, uh, private attorneys system in other counties. And you know, there's a, a lot of question about about when people have access to, to public defense, and and that has a huge impact also uh, in terms of of pretrial detention. If you if you don't see a lawyer until you know your first trial date. Uh, you know, you don't have the right, you, you're not getting counsel uh, that, that could help you negotiate, you know, terms of release early on at arraignment or during your first hearing. And so uh, your public defenders are historically underfunded, but like I say, in North Carolina, not everybody even has access to a public defender. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there uh, to assure that there's equity in, in the system. And Matthew, uh, I, I don't know if you'd like to comment further yeah, I don't know that I have much more to say other than, um, you, you know, people have the right to have counsel, you know, present for them and it, they should have, you know, counsel present from the earliest moment when they're brought in the pretrial system. And there is research that shows that individuals have better outcomes the sooner defense attorneys are put in place. 
And I think that, and, and this is what I'd like to talk about in, our, in my time today, is that I think that we're at a place now where people are, you know, we're, we're speaking about bipartisan solutions to um, the unintended negative consequences from mass incarceration. And I think a big problem is very often people say there's not enough funding or we can't afford this thing. Well, this thing is public defense and you can't, the system doesn't operate if you can't have it. You know, um, you know, I don't get to drive my car when it runs out of gas just because I want to get down the street. And, and the same here, that public defenders are an essential part of the criminal justice system and individuals have a right to have counsel. And we need to, to move away from from arguments that say we can't afford a thing to saying we're going to ensure that we afford this very important element of the criminal legal system that we know that, again, the people, <laughs> Rashawn, the question is so important um, because the very people that um, need those services are the most vulnerable in society. And, and they're people whose lives are hinging on $150, you know, $100 on what to, to probably to, to most of us on this webinar today are, are relatively small amounts of money. And, and I think that we we as as people and, and us as experts coming up with solutions have the ability to um, propose reforms that move away from allowing um, policymakers to uh, kind of scapegoat the issue of just to say that there's not enough funding. I mean, we spend $90 billion building prisons and jails and stuff. So we need to, you know, we need to put our priorities where they should be, I think. Great point. You know, I, and, and on that point, I want to ask you all about some of your short term reforms, because I found them to be, uh, I mean, just critically important and very well thought through. Uh, one is the cost benefit analysis of pretrial and sentencing practices, when it, which in a sense you all are speaking to, um, to set fines and fees or the ability to pay. So instead of using potentially one scale, it's actually what can people afford? And then another one is holding prosecutors accountable for filing and plea bargaining decisions, which we know is oftentimes laced with inequality. And then just to literally reconsider probation and parole practices that contribute to mass incarceration. So will you all mind just each taking uh, one or two of those um, in terms of how you think through these short-term reforms, why they're so important and why it's things that we should see happen uh, nationwide? Um, I'll, I'll start with the cost benefit analysis. Uh, I think I'm the, I may be the only economist on the panel, but anyway, I'll start, I'll start with that and, and just build off of what Matthew was saying, because as he was talking about, you know, uh, access to a public defender, you know, I was reminded again that, you, you know, the fines and fees, which is the second point here, right? The fines and fees are, are paid by the defendants. And so the people who, who are, are being, asked to pay court costs and, and, and other fi fines for supervision, you know, places charge people for jail, right? Oh. So if you're jailed, you have to pay for your night in jail, which it seems really bizarre. And, you know, I, I think a lot of this hinges on this notion of, of what's equitable and it goes down to the sentencing one as well. But what makes sense? We had a colleague uh, on one of our projects who was observing a, a, a local um, hearing and, and and a guy got 30 days in jail. He was sentenced to 30 days in jail for biting into a chicken sandwich at a seven, well, at a, at a you know, 7-Eleven type, type place. And you think about it. So he destroyed maybe a $5 sandwich and he got a prison sentence or a jail sentence at minimum. And this is post his pretrial detention that probably cost the local taxpayers, you know, fifty dollars a night, fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, where's where's the logic in that? I mean, where's where's the reasonableness in that? And so, one reason these happen goes back to something that was discussed in the policing panel, which is who pays and who benefits. And the way that our justice system is set up, you know, the the cost of what you're doing, the cost of a of a prison sentence, isn't apparent to a judge who imposes it. So when he, he you know, as far as a judge is concerned, prison's free. You know, sometimes it's even being paid for by a different level of government, right? So you send somebody to prison for 10 years and you don't have to think about what that's costing the taxpayers of your state and whether or not the offense is really worthy of that. And then if we had time to talk about this and it's addressed in some of the uh, others of the chapters in here, this notion of rehabilitation and whether sitting someone in jail or prison or sitting someone in prison for 10 or 20 years 
is going to accomplish a goal of rehabilitation, right? And whether they're going to come back and be, you know, and be good. So thinking about whether the punishment and the cost of that punishment is appropriate for the severity of the offense. I think there needs to be more consideration of that. And, and then the same thing with fines and fees. There was a, 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 an effort tried in, I think in the United Kingdom uh, not 20 years ago that basically said fines and fees will be based on income and which led to some pretty draconian you know, traffic fines for a multimillionaire who got a hundred thousand dollar speeding ticket, but but the you know on the side that we're talking about here, you know, saying that you know maybe you you tie um, uh, the fines and fees to the ability to pay is something that only makes sense because the other thing that we don't realize is the inability to pay fines and fees results in people getting arrested and placed in jail where they're held until that can be adjudicated, and then you know you end up in this the cycle where you know people just find it. It, almost impossible to to dig their way out. And so, you know, I think thinking about the economics of our system and who pays and who benefits and whether or not the punishment fits a crime is, is something that we really need to pay more attention to. And something that actually it would be fairly easy to do in the in 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 the in the short run in terms of setting, you know, making explicit what the costs are. Yeah. Matthew, what are your thoughts on on you all short term reforms? Yeah, thanks, Rashawn. Yeah, I'll be quick here. I know we're short on time, but I think, you know, with, um, you know, with prosecutors, it's really moving towards um, uh, increased uh, transparency and data tracking of, of the decisions that they make across the system, really recording their plea bargaining decisions and negotiating, putting those in writing, uh, documenting those and putting those on the record. Uh, and just, you know, there's a lot of great prosecutors across the country and, and you know, we know they're doing a really difficult job, uh, but really kind of uh, getting rid of uh, how opaque a lot of their decisions are, I think could be really helpful uh, to, to kind of put it simply. And then moving towards probation and parole. I think a lot of this comes back to my first point of that. We know that there are very, um, that there are little benefits to pretrial detention and really, I would argue, detention overall. So what we should try to do with probation and parole is move towards having, you know, valid conditions, valid conditions of probation and parole that meet the needs for those individuals. Um, I'm not sure if people on the webinar are aware, but most of your conditions for probation and parole are set by statute. So you're convicted of X, so you get this basket of of probation and parole goodies, uh, you're convicted of something else, you get a different basket. Uh, and those baskets may not be related to the individual's needs at all. And they can be very large baskets that require a lot of different things that are very difficult for people to meet, you know, such as, um, you know, something that we've argued in research and, and uh, previously is this idea of drug testing. We know that um, a lot of times drug testing is just a blanket condition, but is that really a problem that a lot that somebody is having? Is that a need that needs to be addressed? Um, or should there not be drug testing? Is that something to really waste uh, probation officers time with? Uh, so then this dovetails into the use of graduated sanctions, looking um, again for non-incarcerated sanctions. There's been a move towards short-term uh, use of jail. We need to remember that jail is very consequential. Spending, um, you know, I don't know, for me, an hour, a minute, any amount of time in jail is a long amount of time. And in, in, in all seriousness, for these individuals, 24 hours in jail, 48 hours in jail, that's a very serious thing. Um, and so we should try to use those things as last resorts, which dovetails into our last uh, recommendation for this one, which is um, really controlling the use of revocation and only using revocation for the most egregious of actions repeated serious technical violations um, and new crimes. Uh, you know, something to consider is about 25 to about 30 or so percent of new prison admissions are due to a probation parole revocation. Uh, so about a quarter to a third of new prison admissions are due to somebody having their probation or parole uh, revoked. So we just wanna move to where we can, you know, as part of this reform movement, we come to this idea that we recognize that incarceration and detention are consequential and should be used as sparingly as possible. Yeah. And Brent, I want to ask you, because one of, because I mean, look, Matthew and Pam not only talked about the short term reforms, but also touched on the long term reforms, particularly thinking about revising sentencing statutes. But I want to ask you as a person who's been a, who spent a lot of time in the federal government, working across agencies, leading various things. Can you talk about the importance of interagency collaboration, which was one of the midterm reforms for this particular chapter? 
Yeah, um, thanks, Rashawn. It's really uh, it's really important. I think we've got at the federal level uh, in terms of responses to the universe, the broad universe of problems associated with uh, criminal justice, incarceration, reentry. Um, we've got a, a, a problem that's analogous to what happens at the local level. Um, at the local level, as we've talked about this morning, I mean, we've got sort of one response to problems of public order. You know, we rely, we over, as you were saying, Rishon, we over rely on the police. We ask them to do things that they fundamentally aren't prepared to do. They, it's not in there. It shouldn't be in their remit to be dealing with homelessness and alcohol abuse and drug, drug abuse and, you know, all of the many kinds of day-to-day uh, -day incidents that police get called to do. Um, so, uh, and we, we need a, a broader uh, portfolio of responses. Well, part of that is really getting the federal agencies talking to one another as well. Um, you know, uh, it, it's easy to get into this keyhole where you're just looking at um, this as a law enforcement issue. Uh, and looking through the Justice Department lens on, uh, on criminal justice. Uh, it's a Labor Department issue. It's an Education Department issue. It's a Health and Human Services Department issue, uh, particularly with things like substance abuse and mental health. SAMHSA should be at the table, you know, to help inform practice um, and policy and guidance um, to um, state and local police departments. So, uh, it's absolutely vital. Uh, I know that uh, during the Obama administration, there was an interagency council. Um, uh, uh, I think that those kinds of things are helpful. I think it would be even more helpful to be focusing on uh, or to provide some additional focus on what are we actually trying to do here. What we're actually trying to do is diversify the toolkit um, for working on public safety, public order questions. Um, and, uh, and, and that, uh, that kind of approach, I think is both necessary and lacking. Yeah. I, I want to ask, um, Pam and Matthew, uh, a final question. And then Brent, I'm going to ask you a question as we conclude and you give your concluding remarks. So for Matthew and Pam, Kenneth Goldsmith from the American Bar Association, ask a, an important question that we've kind of been the, the whole point of this uh, this working group, in fact, is what are the key lessons learned for how to sell systemic change to lawmakers who want to look who who want to look like reforms are per se weakening the system. So, in other words, they don't want to think about these reforms because they don't want to perceive to be weakening the criminal justice system or policing as an institution. What are the key lessons learned for how to sell systemic change to those policymakers? I think that I would ask a question back, which is what of, of these individuals, which is, you know, what is the most important goal for you? And is it retribution? Is it incapacitation? Is it deterrence? Is it rehabilitation? And which of these, so I guess this is two questions, which of these do you think will make communities safer? And, and, once I think you decide on what you, you know, retro, retribution, you can just lock people up forever and you don't have to worry about the rest of it. But, you know, if, you're, if your goal is really to make communities safer, then I think there needs to be a serious discussion in this country about how much attention needs to be paid to each of those uh, purposes of our criminal justice system and which of those and in what proportionality do we think we can best achieve safety in our communities? And so that would be that would be my response back. Mm, that was good, Matthew. Yeah, it's a hard one to follow, huh, Ray Sean? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Pam. I mean, I think definitely getting to first principles is essential. And and what I would argue is is I guess I would say the system is already weak. I would say the lesson that we've learned is that the system is weak. If it's a system, it's broken. Um, and it needs to be fixed. It's not addressing the needs of individuals and communities. And I would also remind um, any policymakers 
of the 1970s. And the 1970s were a time when we had um, increasing crime rates. Um, there were um, high levels of drug overdose deaths. And there was a bipartisan movement to reform the criminal justice system. And what came out of that was mass incarceration. Yeah. And where we are sitting today is somewhere relatively similar. And we have the opportunity today um, to recognize those problems that we created. The unanticipated negative consequences of those reforms have been, like you started with, Rashawn, one, you know, 33% of, of young black males are ending up in jail and prison. We know that we have, you know, thousands of people sitting on death row today, uh, thousands of people sitting in prison uh, with, for life without parole. We know that we have incarceration rates that, that are, are far out of whack with our Western uh, counterparts. And we know that right now, as we're all speaking, we have a half a million individuals that are sitting in jail pre-trial, mostly because they can't afford bail to be released. And, and financial conditions of bail is not a new problem. This is a problem that's been around for hundreds of years in that the Eighth Amendment, um, you know, had been, you know, talked about in the 17th century and, you know, was penned along with the Bill of Rights. So, I mean, these are not new problems. And so I think if we want to say that reform would weaken the system, we need to look at where the system is at now. And um, it's, it's, it's probably as weak as it can be. And so we need to, you know, make some changes. Oh, you, you two are great. I think that is a, a great way to end this, this panel. Um, and I think that everyone is seeing the caliber of experts that we have um, for the working group. So Brent, I want to um, ask you as we close and we get your closing remarks, is how can the United States transition from the current state that, that we've been describing? And, and a weakened system, as Matthew said, I think that's important to note that people think that it's not weak. It's, it already is, and it must be leveled up. So how can the United States transition from the current state to, uh, to the desirable future state while minimizing negative effects and possible reactionary policies? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for leaving me with that simple question uh, to try to wrap up on, Rishon. That's very kind of you. Uh, you, you know, um, the the whole purpose of this working group is to try to not not to address just the pressing matters that we have on us right now uh, in the you know the wake of uh, uh, George Floyd's uh, killing and the uh, protests and the move movement for reform, all of which are extremely important. But we want to try to foster a broader discussion of how interlinked all of these different elements are in uh, criminal justice reform. You can't take them uh, one at a time. Uh, now, having said that, we also can't solve them all at once. Um, you know, that there is going to be a period of, of innovation, of testing, of evaluation, of trying to shift um, the way that the system as a whole operates to something that's really just, I think, more consistent with who we are as Americans, which is uh, a, a, a criminal justice system that is concerned with preventing and punishing wrongdoing when it occurs, but is also committed to rehabilitation. And uh, the notion that once you uh, pass through the criminal justice system, that ought not be the end of your story. Uh, unfortunately, I think that um, too often, uh, the, the presence of a criminal record is often the end of the story, and, and it shouldn't be the end of the story for any individual necessarily. Um, we need to focus on um, aspects of this problem that are really built around uh, helping people to recover from the experience of having committed crime, having been in prison, and now uh, uh, hopefully transitioning to a better life. Um, and, and so, as I said, um, kind of early on in this discussion, I think we would do ourselves a disservice um, by focusing exclusively on these front end issues. Uh, we've got a big human capital problem sitting in the middle of the criminal justice system. Uh, and those are the issues uh, that we want to explore in future conversations. What are we going to do to help people get out of the criminal justice system and stay out.
Yeah, I think that's great. And of course, people should read the report because some of the, the latter chapters focus on that. I mean, as we conclude, I think we keep trying to put band-aids on open wounds and it's time to perform surgery on our criminal justice system. Everyone wants it. So look, we're out of time. Um, we just want to thank everyone for participating. We want to thank the, the team at Brookings, the comms team, the events team, the tech team, development, and in particular, last and definitely not least, but save for last purposefully, is Samantha Elizado, who all of us have interacted with, who is my research assistant. We, we could not have uh, done all of this without her amazing work that she does. So thank you all for your time and thanks for attending. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.